Good to see some of you, most of you, I think. Some of you need to leave your mask on. <laughs> the law said to Moses, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. But grace put shoes on the prodigal son. What mercy, what pardon he found. Jesus was the door that opened up to heaven. He died to take the sinner's place. But if you ever get to walk on men, you gotta go by grace. Works don't matter at the foot of the cross. Jesus paid it all, you see. Salvation is free. holy place but if you ever get to walk on in you gotta go by grace that's right that old tabernacle was the place for the police to offer sacrifices for sin the roof said people had to stay out but grace said Salvation is free to any and all who will just trust and believe. That veil tore down from the top to the bottom to open up a holy place. But if we ever get to walk on in, you gotta go like a Works don't matter at the foot of the cross. Jesus paid it all, you see. Salvation is free to any and all who will just trust and believe. That they'll tore down from the top to the bottom to open up a holy place. So if you ever get to walk on in, you gotta go my way. If you ever get to walk on in, Have you missed this? Yeah. Wow, great start today. Phyllis and Laurie on the instruments and back here. Wow, I've missed this live, haven't you? Yeah, you've been watching it online, but wow, nothing like being here and great to see you. Welcome to the regathering, amen? I am glad you're here. Welcome newlyweds over here. Uh, we're excited to see you, Gail and Danny. Welcome to the newlyweds. And happy birthday to Pat Gamble. This is just a celebration for everybody today. And I am excited you're here. Yesterday was wonderful. Around 75 of us met here yesterday for our uh, prayer march, joining with uh, thousands in Washington, D.C. I hope you saw that. Uh, wasn't that amazing in Washington, D.C.? They did not burn any buildings. They didn't tear down any monuments. They just prayed and sang. And wasn't it wonderful? It was great. Well, we did the same thing here yesterday and had a great time. And thank you for all of you that were with us. Well, you haven't been able to do this with me in a long time, so let's proclaim it. All right, are you ready? This is the day the Lord has made, and we will. Celebrate. Yes, we will. And celebrate if, for those of you that are watching at home still. Thank you for our online guests. I'm glad that you're a part. If it's your first time here and I only met one, uh, came with Deb Cotton, only one, but maybe there are others. I can't tell with your mask on if you're a first time guest or if you've been here before. But if not, stop. If you've been here, haven't been here before, stop at our guest uh, services desk and get a guest gift bag that we have for you. 
And we're excited that you're here today. I want you to do something. I want you to stand up and I want you to wave at our online folks. Everybody stand up, turn around because we got a bunch of folks uh, worshiping with us online and we are glad that you're here. And while you're standing, I want you to sing some of them. Now listen, some of you, we, we're going to get, we're going to get little stickers to put on everybody for the next few weeks. One will say, I shake hands. One will say, I hug. And one will say, don't touch me. That's right. All right. And because th- we don't know what to do. We don't know whether to elbow bump or to wave or to handshake or, or what. And I just waved at somebody and they said, don't I get a hug? And I said, well, yes, if you want one. And I'm not afraid. Uh, I'll hug anybody. That's just me. Uh, my wife said I could hug everybody that was under eight and over 80 <laughs> until I got to be 75. And then she was changing the rules. Hey, do this while you're standing. We're going to sing together. At least wave at somebody. If you're a handshaker, shake hands. If you're not, please don't do that. And if you do, then you got to go to the stations and wash your hands anyway. So just wave at everybody and say, I'm glad to see you. Let's sing it. Bigger than all of my problems. Bigger than all my fears. God is bigger than any mountain that I can. Bigger than all of my questions, bigger than anything. God is bigger than any mountain that I... You didn't do that very well. You got to wave a little better. One more time. Bigger than all of my problems. Good. Bigger than all my fears. Much better. Bigger than any mountain that I can or cannot see. Bigger than all of my questions, bigger than anything. God is bigger than any mountain that I can or cannot see. All right, I'm going to give you a little bit of break. You can sit down for a moment, but once we get into this song, I'm probably going to have to get you to stand up again. Okay, Brad. Because you're going to like it. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you've been trying to fill the same old hold inside. Well, there's a better life. There's Ready? a better life. Stand. If, if you, you got, got pain, pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. And if you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Woo! We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the sake on fight. We've all run to things we know it just ain't right. Well, there's a better life. Well, there's a better life. All right, here we go. Oh, if you got pain, he's a pain taker. And if you feel lost, he's a way maker. You need freedom. And if you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you believe it, somebody testify. Oh. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify, testify. Oh, if you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. And if you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking 
faith or if you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Oh, if you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking saint. Or if you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Lord Jesus, I thank you that we can announce that you are a chain breaker. And many in this room know the joy of having the chains broken in our life. Chains broken from sin, chains broken from habits, chains broken from so many things in our emotions and our habits. And God, we thank you that when we have pain, you're a pain taker. But there's a greater, greater thing that we can announce, and that's that you are a chain breaker. Thank you for breaking the chains of sin in my life and the lives of so many. And today we testify to that. You're a great God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Be seated. Holly was practicing that at home, and her daughter, Osley Ann, said, when she got to the part, somebody testify. She said, somebody tell a lie. <laughs> Well, we're going to tell the truth about it. Amen. Somebody tell a lie. Hey, I hope you are registered to vote. I talked to the folks for a little bit here yesterday. I hope you're ready. How many are registered to vote? Oh, I hope you are. Make sure you are now. You can hope you are and not be sure. So you can go online and make sure you're registered to vote. We only have 36 days before the election. It's so important that everybody is registered to vote. And then vote. Don't just register, but vote. Go out and vote. If you don't use your freedom to do that, you may lose your freedom to do that. So it's important that you do that. If, if you are voting by mail, in other words, you've got your ballot by mail, can I just have a minute of your time? Did you know that 21% of the ballots that are surrendered through the mail are disregarded because there's something wrong with them? Maybe there, you did, forgot to sign it. Maybe you didn't get a witness. Maybe you didn't dot an I or cross a T. And wouldn't that be sad for you to register to vote and then to vote and then your ballot be thrown out because of some technicality? So I've asked Brad Carmine, my son-in-law, who's a poll worker, and Tom Galinsky, who's a poll worker, and um, uh, Frank, you, you guys are poll workers, right? Okay. So these folks, they know what to look for. And they are available to look at your ballot. Now, you only have like Wednesday for coming to prayer meeting or next Sunday and because Monday's the deadline. And so if you have your mail in ballot before you send it in, bring it next Sunday. Let them look over it and make sure uh, that everything's right. And that way you'll, your vote, vote will count. So I just want to encourage you. I, I don't know of a more important election in my life. And so I hope you feel it's that important to make sure your ballot is is uh, legit and ready to go and doesn't get doesn't get cast out. So be sure you do that. Our small groups are cranking back up again. Uh, Tom Galinsky's group starts this coming Thursday, meets right here. Uh, Bob Chase's group uh, starts soon. Sally Chase's group starts soon. All that information is in the bulletin. So be sure you look at it and get involved in a small group. We began meeting back at Perkins a couple of weeks ago. And so we're meeting every Wednesday. At first, we said you need to register. You don't need to do that any longer. They are Now you know uh, doors are wide open at restaurants now. So we don't have a limitation. Our men are meeting at 730. Our ladies are at 10 on Wednesday, every Wednesday at Perkins. Come and pray with us. Today, I'm going to ask you in a little while to find your communication card is right in the middle of your of your worship program and have have that completed you can leave it in your seat as you leave today i'll remind you again at the end just leave it in your seat but your prayer request part is at the bottom of that and we will pray over those at our wednesday prayer gathering so a buddy will have those to lead in our men melanie will have those to lead with our ladies at the at the prayer brunch so be sure we know your prayer requests we don't know how to pray for you if you don't tell us so be sure you do that and and uh, we'll we'll pray for those at our, uh, at our prayer time. Uh, David Jarrett uh, is uh, chairman of our stewardship committee, and he's uh, coming to address you for just now. David. Before I say anything at all about our um, stewardship or our treasury, uh, I wanted to address what's on your screen right now. Beginning next Sunday, that's October 4th. Uh, it's what 
all the area churches and all the, I guess, churches worldwide are in uh, all over the, the country um, are recognizing as Pastor Appreciation Month, which is a time set aside for us to recognize and appreciate all that our pastors do, the pastoral families do, uh, others leading, uh, leading in the church. Uh, they, they play such an important role. And we need to show them the honor and respect that they deserve. Now, we're not only fortunate to have an excellent pastor, but we've got a great worship leader in Randy, a very inspirational singer in Holly. And we need to show them that we love them, we appreciate them. There's boxes starting next week in the foyer with their names on there. Just like we've done in the past. You probably remember it. We need to drop something, a card or a gift or something in there just to let them know that we love them. And if you agree with that, nod your head this way. <laughs> okay. Now, don't forget, it's next Sunday. Chances are, if, if you forget, there's three more Sundays afterwards. Okay? Now, I know... When we get to this age, that memory becomes an issue. And I'm, I'll share with you something about memory. There's three ways you can tell you're getting old. One of them is you have a tendency to forget things. What were those other two? <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Uh, now, as to the offertory. Uh, at the end of the service, I think we're going to have ushers at each door. Uh, give generously if you can. Uh, I don't mind telling you, uh, working with the stewardship committee, we've been monitoring our offerings, which have been fairly good throughout the year. But this particular month, I thought maybe all of you went to Alaska on vacation or something. Uh, offerings are way down this month. We need to pick up the pace just a little bit to finish this quarter. Then we'll start a new quarter next, uh, next week, actually. Uh, s examine your heart. Think seriously about what we're doing as a church, what we need to do individually and as a corporate body. We love the Lord, and we need to give because he's given to us. <laughs> Let's pray. Father... Our lives are so richly blessed because of your love for us. And we sure love you. Help us to examine our hearts. Realize that everything that we've received has come from you. And we're just going to give back a little portion of it. Jesus, help us as a nation as a church here and as individuals, we need each other and we're going to visualize, if you can, hand in hand, walking across one day in glory. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your blessed name. And we enthusiastically say, Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Phyllis. Psalm 139 begins this way. You've searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lip lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day. The darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am, say it church, and your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Lord Jesus, you're the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper. And because that's who you are, we worship you today. May your word find a lodging place in our heart this morning. 
May we listen on purpose, knowing that we didn't come here today except that you wanted to teach us something. So may our hearts be open, may our ears be open, may our mind be open, may we be alert and awake, and may we receive from the Holy Spirit what you want to teach us today. I pray this in the sweet name of the miracle worker, way maker, promise keeper, Lord Jesus. Amen. From the reading of the scripture a little bit ago, you picked up, I hope, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. For the next few weeks, I want to talk to you about how God has wired us up or how God made us, how he's created us, because there's no accident in the way we've been designed and created, and we're wired up differently. We can't all do the same thing. We don't all understand the same way. We don't all even speak the same languages. We're, we're wired up differently, and God made us that way on purpose, and that's why the scripture says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. In fact, we're fearfully and wonderfully made in different ways. Uh, we're fearfully and wonderfully made spiritually. We're physically different. We're psychologically different. We're emotionally different. We're temperamentally different. Uh, God has wired us differently in all these different ways. If you've ever watched on television the Antique Roadshow, uh, it's kind of interesting. Anybody, anybody ever see that, the Antique Roadshow? Yeah, I, I love it when people bring in some object that they think is worth $5,000, but then for our entertainment and to their sadness, it's only worth $50. But it's kind of entertaining to watch. Now, here's the thing about the items that they bring in. The value of them is determined by the authority who is educated to know the value of those things. And so when they bring it in, they're bringing it to somebody who, that they're an expert in that area, whether it's jewelry or whether it's uh, art or whether it's pottery or whatever it might be, they're an expert. A number of years ago, many years ago, a, a lady gave me something that belonged to her grandfather. It was a watch fob. And the time she gave it to me, people wore watch fobs because you wore a vest. And I loved it and wore the watch fob. I didn't have a watch, but I wore the watch fob. And I looked like I was somebody, you know. And my wife and I were at a conference one day and we're standing singing. And the lady next to me kind of almost shocked me. She reaches over and she slides her hand under it. And my wife looks at her like, what are you doing? And she says, I can't believe you have the nerve to wear that out in public. Well, I, I thought maybe it was vulgar. But I found out it had value. And ever since then, I've been trying to sell it. <laughs> hey, I'm not sentimental. But I didn't know it had value. On the other hand, a man gave me a a framed copy of a 1776 front page of the Boston Gazette. It was in a glass encasement where you could see both sides of it. And he, when he gave it to me, he said, I'm giving it to you under one agreement that you will agree to always have it insured for $5,000. I thought, I have me a treasure. And so I added it to my insurance policy only to find out later it was a fake. I probably paid more in insurance premiums on it than it was worth. So when you go to these antique road shows, you think you have something of value and you're hoping they're going to tell you, oh, that's worth $5,000. And they say it's only 50. But, but, but here's my point. The point is the authenticity and the value of it is determined by the person who is deemed an authority. Now I'll give you that illustration because I ask you this, what gives people value? What gives you value? You have value based on the authority of the word of God who created you. Are you with me? He's the authority. And he says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And when you think I'm nothing or I'm not worth anything or I have no value, you need to go to the word of God and be reminded that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And the expert said that. The expert who is God Almighty said that in Psalm 139. Now, let me tell you some ways he made you. First of all, he made you with detail. God says you were formed in your innermost parts. You were knit together in your mother's womb. If you'll just let me step aside for a minute, how in the world could we read that and believe that aborting a baby is okay? 
You were knit together in your mother's womb. Before you were born, God knew what your life was going to be. Verses 14 and 15 says that you are a unique creation. Do you understand you're unique? You're different from anybody. Else. There's not another one of you. Even if you are called identical twins, you're still different. You're still different. Because you're a unique creation. There's nothing, there's something about you that's different from anybody else. Now, sometimes you look at yourself and say, I, I don't like myself because I don't like the talent I have or don't have. I don't like the skill I have or don't have. I don't like the gifts I have or the spiritual gifts I don't have. And you look at yourself and you think I don't have worth, but God says you do have worth because you're unique and you're wonderfully and fearfully made and you do have great value. Sometimes in the same way, people will look in the mirror and say, I don't like the way I look. God created you. You look the way you look because that's the way God wanted you to look and he created you that way. You, you are, you are, when, when, listen, when somebody, even yourself tells you that there's no value in you, you need to stop and say, that's a lie right out of the pit of hell. God made you. You look the way you look because God made you. You have the eyes you have because God decided your eyes should be blue or brown or green or hazel or, or whatever. That your hair should be blonde or black or brown or suddenly none. <laughs> But God made you. He designed you. Your nose is the way God made it. Now, some like Frank had to have theirs fixed. But, <laughs> but you're, originally, God made it, and he made it perfect. When I was younger, I had like they called it a ski slope on my nose. And I broke my nose several times. And about the third time, I said, could you just do a little plastic surgery along with fixing it? And, then, and they did, and it's not quite the slope that it used to be. And I didn't like my nose, but I didn't realize then God made my nose the way he made my nose because that's the way my nose needed to look. And God made me six feet five because that's the way he wanted me to look. And God made me with uh, green eyes because he wanted me to have green eyes. Now the weight part is up to you, but, <laughs> but the rest of it, God fearfully and he wonderfully made you. Your feet are the way God made them to be. And so he made you with great detail. Not only that, but he made you with direction. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper and to give you hope. Plans for a future. Have you, have you ever thought about the thing, that, that the fact that God thinks about you? As a matter of fact, David said, when I wake up, I realize you've been thinking about me. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't a dream. God was thinking about you. And he was planning your direction. He, he made you with detail. He made you with direction. And then he made you deliberately. We were planned. Look at me. Nobody is an accident. Your parents may have had an accident, but you're not an accident. Because you were fearfully and wonderfully made. God made you on purpose. He knitted you together in your mother's womb. You are here on purpose. And God made you deliberately. And we need to understand that. He knew when he made you how long you would live. And he knew how, how you would live as long as you live. Now what I want to do for the next few weeks is I want to talk to you about how you are wired up. And this morning particularly how you're emotionally wired up. Because everybody is an emotional being, everybody. Sometimes I hear folks say, well, I just don't have much emotion. Yes, you do. We just have to find the button. But everybody has, everybody has different emotions. Some of you, you can watch Bambi. And when Bambi's mother gets, gets killed, you just cry and cry for weeks. A week after you watch it, somebody said, what, what's going on with you? <laughs> I still remember watching Bambi's mother. And that emotion is in you. That's okay. That's the way God made you. Some of you, you go to a ball game and your team does well and you get excited and your team does poorly and you still get excited. You get upset at the umpires. Roger. <laughs> and you show emotion. Roger umpires all kinds of kids games and the parents are worse than the kids, aren't they? And they've got all kinds of emotions. And, and while I've done some things understandably out of emotion, I, I've also done some stupid things out of emotion. Anybody with me? Out of emotion. 
Now, there's no, everybody's an emotional person, but now listen to me. There's nothing wrong with showing emotion. There's nothing wrong with it. Sometimes it may not lead to a smart conclusion. I've never understood, just me personally, I've never understood how somebody's emotions could get so big that they'd run their hand through a wall or throw, the, throw a plate at their spouse. I just, I, that's just, I just don't understand that. But, but, there's, but, but there's nothing wrong with showing emotion. But don't let your emotions get so out of control that you want to burn down a city. And our emotions, we have them. We all do. Don't, get, don't let your emotions get so out of control that you abuse a child. But everybody has emotions and there's nothing wrong with showing emotions as long as they're under control of the Holy Spirit. Now, the third thing I want you to see is that it is God who wired us with emotions. God's the one who did that. Life in a New York City slum took a turn recently when a young girl went into the bathroom at her home and gave birth to a six-pound baby. She held the baby closely for just a couple of minutes and then did what a 12-year-old girl would do. She cleaned herself up, put on clothes, and went to school just after she had put the baby down the trash chute at her apartment. At school, the story came out. Her teacher began to notice she was slumping over and holding her stomach most of the day. And when she finally inquired, she found out that she was a victim of something that could be said of a thousand other little 12 year old girls. She didn't know her father, didn't her own father. She didn't know her mother was a drug addict who was almost rarely at home. And she was raised by an aunt who didn't even want her and only did it out of obligation. She was left alone most of the time in a drug infested ghetto. And Oh, the father of the baby, her 21 year old cousin. Now here's my question for you. Are you listening? If I had been able to bring this 12 year old little girl here today and tell you that story, how would you feel? A bunch of emotions would rise up in you, wouldn't they? A bunch of emotions. How many of you would have a wave of sadness go through you? How you did just me telling you the story. How many of you would get angry? How many of you would want to take the 21-year-old cousin out and teach him a lesson he'd never forget? That's because God made us with emotions and stories like that cause all kinds of emotions to rise up within us. We start thinking about what's the future like for a young girl like that. Then there's a little sigh of relief when we learn that the baby was found just minutes before the garbage compactor took over. But emotions, God made them and God has wired us up. And all of you felt something when I told you that story. Everybody here felt something. Maybe not all the same thing. But we all felt something because God has put emotions within us. God has wired us up to be emotional beings. Sometimes it's sadness and sometimes it's anger and sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's pain and hurt and joy and love and disappointment and, and, and tenderness. There's all kinds of emotions and God wired us up so we would feel those. In the 1960s during the Vietnam War, there was a new term that became a popularized term. It's called the walking wounded. At first, it was meant to talk about folks who had physically been wounded in the Vietnam War, but they were still able to walk among us. In other words, they were not invalids in hospitals. They were not maimed for life, so to speak. But they were, they were wounded, but they were walking among us. We called them the walking wounded. And at first, it meant those physically, physically wounded, but so, soon it came to mean those who were emotionally wounded. In fact, we soon changed the name a little bit to call it folks with post-traumatic stress syndrome. And even today, there's an organization called the International Brotherhood of the Walking Wounded 
It's for those who suffered with post-traumatic stress syndrome, particularly from the, from the Vietnam War. And because our emotions are so complex, this morning I want to ask you several questions because the emotions that are in all of us were wired that way by God and we need to learn what's going on inside of us and how God wired us up and what we're to do with those emotions. And are we just to, are we just to, to say, that's the way I am and I can't do anything about it? No. There's some things we need to learn. So let's begin with answering the question, what are emotions? Well, emotions are intense sensations that prompt a movement in a particular area. It's a, it's a, it's a sensation that makes you want to fight. It's a sensation that makes you want to cry. It's a sensation that makes you want to be something different. It's a sensation that makes you want to do something. It's a sensation that, that, that makes you want to change something. That, that's what an emotion is. You feel this overwhelming wave within you. And because of that, I'm going to change. I'm going to do. I'm going to be. I'm going to fight. I'm going to, there's something's going to happen as a result of that. The intense ang emotion of anger prompts you to strike back, to launch out, to fight many times. The intense emotion of fear urges you to stay away from some things. Years ago, a friend invited me to a church in Kentucky. I found out it was a snake handling church and my fear of snakes prompted me not to go. And, and the, the intense emotion of fear will cause us to do or not to do certain things. Intense emotion of happiness causes us maybe to want to dance. My wife loves music in the house and we have this machine called Siri and you say, hey Siri, play something and Siri will play whatever you want Siri to play. And the other day our little granddaughter was over there and my wife played the boogie woogie or something. It was a hot number. And little Asley I says, there's a beat in these bones. Where does she hear that? But see, that's an emotion built in us to want to dance, to, 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 to want to laugh, to want to party, to want to celebrate. And that's the way God made us. But every, every emotion will result in some kind of a response. And all of our responses will fit into one of four categories. Either anger or sadness or happiness or fear. We'll either get mad, get sad, get glad or get scared. And every emotion, you can put it in one of those categories. Now, where do they come from? I told you already, they come from God. Because we're wired up, we're made in his image. And so we're wired the way God is wired as well. And many of the emotions you and I feel are emotions that we read about that God had as well. Scripture talks about all kinds of feelings, God feelings. Joy and delight and, and gladness and frustration and disappointment. And, and, and yes, anger. God had all of those feelings and when Jesus was in the flesh here on the earth. And so I wanted to tell you that because I don't want you to think it's wrong to have those. It's not wrong. We're, we're made in the image of God. And the scripture tells us uh, that, that it's, it's full of those. Now, how should we handle our emotions? Well, let me, let me kind of give you an illustration. Close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. And either reach down your seat, rub your hand over the seat cushion there. If you're sitting next to somebody that will allow you to touch them. And, and with your eyes closed, you can, you can open them now. You can begin to discern some things. Uh, I can put my hand here and I can tell that that's probably, that's possibly glass, but no, it's, it's plexiglass, something loose sight, something like that. I, I can move my hand down. There's a paper here. I, I can feel that's paper. And that's because there's these sensations in the tips of your finger that tells you that's hot that's cold that's glass that's dangerous and in the same way we have those emotions will tell you what's going on inside of you you, you the emotion will tell you hey you're afraid of something you're you're scared because of something you're mad because of something you're angry because of something and that's what emotions do. They do the same thing as the, as the tips of our fingers. That's why it's so important to pay attention to your emotions because your emotions are trying to tell you something. My fingertips are trying to tell me, that's hot, don't do it again. Get your hand off of there. And my emotions are trying to tell me something when they react the way they react. 
So how should I handle these emotions? Well, let me give you several ways. First of all, when you, when you sense you have emotions going on, acknowledge them. Don't, don't try to hide from them. Acknowledge them. Don't shoo them away. It's a clue that something is going on in your life. Secondly, name the emotion. Decide what it is. Is it anger? Is it, is it fear? Give the emotion a name. What is it? Because if you don't know what it is, you're not going to know how to handle it. Can I get a witness? So I got to know what it is or I don't know what to do with it. So I've got to name it. And thirdly, deal with it. If it's sadness, decide what's causing it. If it's gladness, decide what's causing it. If it's happiness that makes you want to dance, it's because you've got, you got something beat in your bones. But, but you got to... Once you know what it is and once you name it, then you gotta, you got to deal with the emotion and then feel the emotion. If it's sadness, let yourself weep. Did you hear me? Let yourself weep. Do you understand that weeping is therapeutic? Did you know that God says he catches our tears and puts them in a bottle? Did you hear me? If God catches my tears and puts them in the bottle, don't you think that they're valuable? I don't know how it's going to happen. Are we going to get to heaven one day? And God said, you see that shelf over there? That's all the tears you cried. That's the ones you cried for your children when they were out of fellowship with God. That's the ones you cried for your spouse. Those are the ones you cried. And, and I don't know. But he's going to put them in a bottle. He's going to do something with them if he's going to put them in a bottle. So if it's sadness, let yourself weep. Weeping is therapeutic. By the way, Scripture also says weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You know what always comes after a period of weeping? Victory. Joy. So if it's sadness, let yourself weep. If it's gladness, it's okay to get excited. There was a time you could jump up and click your heels together. Now you're just glad if you can stand up. But if it's gladness, get excited. If it's anger, be angry. Just don't let it turn to sin. Scripture says, be, Ephesians, be ye angry, just don't sin. I mean, I'm angry thinking about the little 12-year-old girl, are you? I'm angry about some of the things going on in America today, aren't you? Now, I'm not going to go shoot somebody because of it. I might slap them in Jesus' name. <laughs> but I'm not going to shoot them. I'm going to be angry about it, but I'm not going to let my anger turn into sin. If it's fear, it's okay. Because you know what? Look at me. Everybody's afraid of something. Don't lie to me. Everybody's afraid of something. I'm afraid of heights. I don't like heights. It scares me when I stand up real fast. I don't, I don't, like, I don't like any heights. And you're afraid of something too. Everybody is. How many are afraid of snakes? How many are afraid of... Hey, I was preaching in, in the Spanish wells in the Bahamas. And they took me out on a boat and put me out in the water. And I don't swim real well. But I had just a, a snorkel and a spear. And all of a sudden, a barracuda comes straight toward me. And I panicked and ran the spear through my leg. <laughs> and when the, I finally got back in the boat, I told them what happened. They said, oh, just sock the barracudas in the nose. I said, you're kidding me. No, next time you're in there and you see a barracuda come, just sock it in the nose. He'll leave you alone. Oh, I'm over at their house later for dinner that night and a roach crawls across and they stand up in a chair. You want me to sock a barracuda and you're afraid of a roach. And I was reminded, everybody's afraid of something. So what next? David assured us this. Listen to Psalm 62 and verse 8. Oh, my people, trust in him at all times. Watch it now. Pour out your heart to him because God is your refuge. Do you understand God's a safe place? Whatever emotion is going on in your life, pour your heart out to him. That's a safe place. 
See, you may not want to come to a friend and tell a friend, I'm afraid of roaches. But you can tell God. You know why you can tell God? First of all, you already knew it. The second one goes to a safe place. You can trust him. Now, let me tell you some common ways that we mismanage our emotions. In the interest of time, I'm going to give you two this morning. But first of all, we deny them. We just act like I don't have that emotion. Now, I'm going to tell you what causes us to deny them. And here's what causes us to deny our emotions. It's possible that we grew up in a family that prohibited us from expressing our emotions. And lots of us may have grown up in a family that said, no, we don't allow anybody to be angry in this family. So you learn to deny it. You may have grown up in a family where you were made fun of because of something. And so now you don't want to talk about it because you were made fun of when you were young. Maybe you were embarrassed. Real men don't cry. And so as a man, you just learn to suck it up and not let your emotions be shown. Because your daddy maybe said, or your mama said, or somebody said, real men don't cry. Real men do cry. Real men do get angry. Real men do get frustrated. Real men have all emotions that anybody else has. But you get slam dunked a couple of times by expressing an emotion and soon you learn to deny it. I'll bet everybody in this room could finish this statement. I'll get it started and you just say it out loud. You stop crying or I'll give you something. And what message does that send to a child? Sadness is badness. And so as a child, I can't be sad so sad that I cry because if I cry, that's bad. And you learn that's an unacceptable emotion. Now, if you don't, if you don't, if you try to keep your emotions down under the surface, it's just a matter of time before they begin to cause other problems. And they may cause problems like a sleeping disorder or an eating disorder or a chemical abuse or sexual compulsions or mental stress or even an untimely breakdown because you've tried to suppress them and deny them and act like they're not there and you don't want to let anybody see that it's going on in your life. And so you, you just, you divert to doing something else. Another tragic consequence is that soon our emotions become almost dead and then we just can't show emotion anymore. The second problem is we allow the emotions to control us. See, God, God wired us up for these, with these emotions, but not so that the emotions enslave us. Scripture says in 2 Timothy, God has not given you the spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and love and of self-discipline. And, and fear is a heightened emotion that says there's danger on the horizon or there's an evil person you need to stay away from. Every good parent teaches their children, don't take candy from a stranger. Why? Because the potential there is evil, danger. But you can't let fear control you so that you believe every person is a dangerous person. We know Satan is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but you can't live your life thinking Satan's behind every door. God doesn't want you to live with a spirit of fear, but of power. Can deep emotions that turn into wounds, can they be healed? Some of you are holding your breath waiting for an answer and because you're experiencing some deep emotional wounds. They probably possibly came from a dysfunctional family life or maybe a marriage that beat you up emotionally or a work environment where your self-worth was destroyed or a friend who betrayed you. And now you wonder, can these deep emotional wounds be completely healed? And the answer is yes, they can. Scripture says all who trust Christ in this life will spend eternity in heaven as a totally transformed child of God living in peace with Christ. So ultimately, our deep emotional wounds can be healed. You say, well, what about now? That talks about heaven. What about now? And the answer is yes, even now, but not alone, not by yourself. 
you're not going to do it by yourself. Some surveyors were working, and every day they would send a crew out to work and survey a part of a raw piece of land. Every night they would come back to the campsite, and there was a shepherd that came over nearby, and he would come and meet with them every night and sit around the campfire, and they would tell stories and talk about different things. He would say, yeah, I've been a shepherd out here a long time. After one particular evening of sitting by the campfire and the shepherd and the, and the surveyors talking, the surveyor said, well, we got to go to bed early. We're going to a far piece of the property tomorrow to do some surveying. And the, the shepherd said, well, not by yourself. I'll go with you. To which the surveyor said, no, you don't need to go with us. You see, we paid a lot of money for an elaborate map of the area. And so you don't need to go. We know exactly where we're going. And the shepherd said, yes, but your map doesn't show fog. You and I may think that we know how to work through our emotions and our hurts and our pain and our dysfunctionality. But as we start, we didn't take into consideration fog, things that are going to spring up, things that are going to pop up, things that are going to come unexpectedly. And we're not going to be able to do it alone. You can't do it by yourself. You start boiling a pot of water put water in a pot, what causes it to boil? Not the pot, not the water. It's the fire underneath, right? And when these emotions crank up inside of us, we better learn what the fire is inside of us that causes them to crank up. Many of you are familiar with the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. Joseph's dad married two different women and had two other substitute wives on the side and out of those four women, had 13 children. 12 of them were boys, and one of them was a girl, and she was raped. But Joseph was the child of his favorite wife. And because of that, he gave a special coat that he had made to Joseph. And his brothers hated him for it, and one day they decided to kill him. But while they had him in a pit, one of the brothers talked them out of killing him. And instead of killing him, they decided to sell him into slavery, and they did. Joseph goes to Egypt as a slave, and then soon he winds up in prison because he gets lied about. And then he gets out of prison and becomes second in command in Egypt. During this period of time, there's a seven-year drought, and Joseph, who has wisdom from God and a vision from God, tells the Pharaoh, we need to hoard things up here because there's coming a drought. And they begin to do that so much so that Egypt is the only place in the area who has any grain at all, any food at all. Everybody had to come to Egypt to get the grain including Joseph's extended family back home. So they send an ambassador to Egypt to get food, and most of the brothers come, but they leave the baby brother at home, the other child of Joseph's dad's favorite wife. So when they get there, they don't recognize Joseph. Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize Joseph. It's been a long time. So he tells them, you go back and get your other brother, and you come back, and I'll... I'll feed you when they go back and bring him. Then Joseph reveals who he is and then says, go get dad and bring him here. And Joseph gives them a place to live. And it's a wonderful story. But the great part of the story is that when they come back and learn who Joseph is, they think <laughs> he's going to get revenge now. Yeah, we never thought he would get to this place. But Joseph doesn't, and one of the most powerful verses in all the scripture to me is in Genesis chapter 50. And he says to his brothers, you meant it for evil, and God has used it for good. Do you understand there's so many things in this world that are meant for evil, and God uses them for good? And that's why you and I have to caution ourselves about our anger, because we don't know what God is trying to do. I want you to hear this clearly. Deep wounds in your life will never be healed if you don't let bitterness be healed first. Scripture says get rid of all bitterness. You've got to guard against it. What biographer writing about Robert E. Lee told about the time Robert E. Lee after the war, after the Civil War, had gone to a Kentucky home that had taken care of some soldiers. And when he got there, the woman of the house was mad as she could be. 
And she demanded of Robert E. Lee that he do something about the soldiers. That Look, see this big cypress tree? I bet it's the largest, oldest cypress tree in Kentucky. But I want you to look what soldiers have done. With their ammunition, they have shot holes all in the tree. Look, that limb, has, that limb is just about dead now. And she's just giving Robert E. Lee what for. To which Lee says to her, ma'am, cut the tree down. Cut the tree down. And if we aren't careful, we will seethe over things and we will just relive them and replay the tapes over and over and over until, until our anger turns to bitterness, until our frustration turns to bitterness. And, and that, that bitterness will ultimately destroy us. We've got to guard against bitterness in our life. And then we've got to take some steps toward forgiveness. Some people think forgiveness is simple, but it's not. It's not. It's the human nature to want to get even. It's the human nature to want somebody who has hurt us to get hurt themselves. It's been quiet in here this morning. But a deep wound will stay a deep wound if we don't learn to forgive. And then we've got to believe in God's greater purpose. And that's where Genesis 50 and the verse where Joseph said to his brothers comes into play. You meant it for evil, but God has used it for good to bring glory. And then the last thing, live by promises, not expl exp explanations. I can't believe that when Joseph was down in that pit, that he really believed all God was going to do. But he knew the promises of God. When the caravan came along, his brother sold him into slavery. I can't believe on the way to Egypt that Joseph believed all this was going to work out for good. When Potiphar's wife lied about him and he got thrown into prison, I can't believe while he was in prison that he believed all this was going to work out for good. I'm not even sure that once he got promoted to second in charge that he believed everything was going to work out for good. But he did know the promises of God. Now here's my question to you, and I want you to raise your hand. Do you believe that God will never leave you or forsake you? Joseph believed that too. And so he didn't have to live by, hear me, explanation. He only had to live by the promises of God. I don't understand. People say, why do you think someone's so, so sick? They're such a wonderful person. I don't know. Why can't Buddy be healed? I don't know. Why did... Why did Dave Gallagher and Larry Melton and Barb Krizik in the last 90 days have to leave us? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But I, I don't have to live by explanations. I, I just live by the promises of God. And I know that all three of those folks are in glory. God promised that. And you need to learn to live by the promises of God. I read a book a number of years ago, written by R.T. Kendall. He was the pastor of the Westminster Chapel in London for years, and he wrote a book called Total Forgiveness. And I remember he begins the book, in the opening chapter of the book, by telling a story about Joseph Son, T-S-O-N, Joseph Son of Romania. Joseph was a preacher in Romania, and he had to hide because Romania had the same uh, political structure as the USSR at that time. And he would hide and preach, but they would catch him. And when they would catch him, they would beat him profusely. And they would put him in a solitary confinement for a while. And then they would say, well, we're either going to beat you again tomorrow or we're going to let you out. But if we let you out, what are you going to do? And he was, if you let me out tomorrow, I will preach tomorrow night. And they just out of frustration, they would let him go. But then they would catch him again. This time the crowd would be larger and they would take him and capture him again and put him in solitary confinement and, and beat him and, and, and do other unmentionable things to him. They would say to him, we're going to let you out tomorrow, but what are you going to do? He said, if you let me out tomorrow, I will preach tomorrow night. On three different occasions that happened to Joseph and so much so that the last time they said, we're going to kill you and spill your blood in front of everybody. He said, that will be so exciting. And they were frustrated, excited. Yes, you see, tapes of my sermons 
are distributed all over Romania. And when you spill my blood in the marketplace, everybody will say, what he was preaching must be true if he was willing to die for it. So that will be exciting. And oh, they were so frustrated. They finally decided to exile him to get him out of Romania. R.T. Kendall, who wrote the book Total Forgiveness, was talking to Joseph Stone. And in talking to him one day, he said, I want to tell you a story, Joseph. A man who was kind of like a father to me hurt me severely. So much so I don't ever want to see him again. I, in fact, I've even wished bad things on him. I, I know I'm pastor of a church here in London, but I, I have wished bad things on him. And he told the whole story to Joseph, and he said, what do you think, Joseph? And he was expecting Joseph to say, R.T., I understand exactly how you feel. You have all the right in the world to feel that way. But instead, Joseph said, well, you need to forgive him. To which R.T. Kendall thought, maybe you didn't understand me. And he begins to tell him the story all over again. And this time, Joseph stops him midstream. And here's what he says. If you don't fully forgive him, you will never be free. Some of you want to throw stones at people. I get it. I get it. And, and, and in my humanity, I want to sit by you and hear your story and say, yeah, let me help you find some more stones. But you know what? There are not enough stones. There are not enough stones. You'll keep throwing them, and you'll keep throwing them. But there's not enough stones. Because until you forgive them, you'll never, never be free.
running after you. His goodness. His goodness is running after you. That's why we got to surrender who we really want to be in the flesh and become he, who He wants us to be in the spirit. Sing it. I'm going to sing of the goodness. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise Him. Praise Him. Don't sit down. Thank you. Thank you. You listened well. Don't sit down. No, don't sit down. We're finished. <laughs> Be sure you leave your communication card on your seat. Just leave it there on your chair. We'll have someone to pick them up. We'll pray over these Wednesday. Join with us Wednesday at prayer time at Perkins, 730 men, 10 a.m. ladies. Randy Wilson has ushers at every door. Please be faithful in your giving. Um, we're, we're not pushing a panic button here, but offerings have been low this month. And maybe it's because we haven't been having uh, in-person services. So I'm sure the things will turn around. You've been so faithful all during this terrible pandemic time. So thank you. And thank you for being here today. By and by when the morning comes, Randy. By and by when the morning comes. When the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story how we've overcome, and we'll understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, afternoon. when the saints of God, God are gathered home, home we, we will tell, tell the story of how we've overcome. And we'll understand it better it. by and by. Say play, Laurie. By and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story how we've overcome. And we'll understand it better. Come on, Phyllis, you can play too. E flat. By and by.